Hey folks, in this video we explore the magic of the Gramian, also known as the Gram determinant, and examine its fundamental algebraic and geometric properties. To start, let delta be the determinant function on the plane R2 with delta of E1, E2 equal to 1, where E1 and E2 are the standard basis vectors. Then we know from my past video on determinants and volume that delta of xy is the oriented or signed area of the parallelogram formed by the vectors x and y, as seen here. The absolute value of delta xy is just the ordinary area. If you haven't seen that video I mentioned, be sure to check it out before watching the rest of this video. We know that the area of a parallelogram is just base times height. Using the inner product or dot product in the plane, we can measure height. To do this, we first use orthogonal projection to write y in the form alpha x plus z, where x is orthogonal to z, as seen here. Notice that we write the inner product using parentheses. The vector alpha x is called the projection of y on x, while the vector z is sometimes called the rejection of y from x. Taking the inner product with x on both sides of the equation for y, we immediately obtain that alpha must be x times y over x times x where we assume here that x is non-zero. Now the height of y over x squared is just the length of z squared, which is the inner product of z with itself. By the previous result, that's just the inner product seen here. Expanding this using bilinearity of the inner product, we obtain this. Finally, we can conveniently write the numerator here as a 2 by 2 determinant, like this. Taking square roots of both sides of the outermost equation gives a formula for the height of y over x in terms of x and y using the inner product. That determinant, which is conventionally written g of x, y, is called the Gramian, or Gram determinant, of x and y, and is extremely important with many diverse applications. It's named after the Danish mathematician Jorgen Gram, who worked in the insurance industry and made a number of valuable contributions to mathematics before later being struck and killed by a bicycle. We saw that g of x, y equals the length of x squared times the length of z squared. Since x and z are the base and height of the parallelogram formed by x and y, outlined here, it follows that g of x, y is the square of the base times the height, which is the square of the area of the parallelogram. And of course, we already know that that is just delta of x, y squared. So the Gramian has a close connection to the determinant function delta, and like delta, has a natural geometric interpretation. From the fundamental equation g of x, y equals delta of x, y squared, we obtain other important properties of g, including g of x, y is equal to g of y, x, g of x, y is greater than or equal to zero, and g of x, y is equal to zero if and only if x and y are linearly dependent. As a Seinfeld fan, when g of x, y is zero, I like to say Grammy's getting upset, but that's very non-standard terminology. We can generalize these ideas to higher dimensions. Let E be an n-dimensional inner product space over R. Let E1 to En be an orthonormal basis in E. Let delta be the determinant function on E with delta of E1 to En equal to 1. Delta is called normal because its value on an orthonormal basis has absolute value 1. This is true if and only if its value on any orthonormal basis has absolute value 1, as you can verify. So normality just amounts to assigning the unsigned volume of 1 to any unit n cube, which is a very natural condition. In what follows, the particular choice of determinant function and orthonormal basis is not important, provided that the determinant function is normal. For two sets of vectors x1 to xn and y1 to yn in E, Consider the determinant consisting of the inner products of the x's and the y's, seen here. In this determinant, we have x1 across the first row, x2 across the second row, and so on down to xn across the nth row. Dually, we have y1 down the first column, y2 down the second column, and so on over to yn down the nth column. The x's in the rows and the y's in the columns are multiplied together using the inner product to form the single n by n determinant. This construction gives rise to a function gamma from e to the 2n to r, which maps the x's and y's to the value of the determinant like this. 
Note that we write x with an arrow over it as shorthand for x1 to xn, and similarly for y, just to save space. This function gamma has magical properties. Since the determinant is multilinear and alternating in its rows, and the inner product is bilinear, it follows that gamma is multilinear and alternating in the x's for each fixed selection of y's. And dually, since the determinant is also multilinear and alternating in its columns, gamma is multilinear and alternating in the y's for each fixed selection of x's. This means that gamma x blank, which maps from e n to r, is a determinant function for each x, and gamma blank y, which also maps from e n to r, is a determinant function for each y. By the universal property of delta, it follows that gamma x y equals gamma x e times delta y. Here we applied the universal property to the function gamma x blank, using the fact that delta e equals 1. If you need a refresher on the universal property, take another look at my first video on determinants and volume. By the universal property of delta again, it follows that this equals gamma e e times delta x times delta y. Here we applied the universal property to the function gamma blank e. But this equals delta x times delta y since gamma e e equals 1, as you can easily verify using the definition of gamma and orthonormality of e. So gamma is the product of delta with itself. It's important to note that this relation holds for any normal determinant function delta. It doesn't depend upon the particular choice of determinant function and orthonormal basis we made earlier. Now the Gramian of n vectors is obtained from gamma by taking x equal to y like this. As before, we use the letter g. So the Gramian consists of the inner products of the x's with themselves. It follows from the result just established that g of x1 to xn equals delta of x1 to xn squared. This fundamental relation generalizes the one we saw earlier in the case of n equal to 2. So this is the Gramian of n vectors, where n is the dimension of the ambient space. But what about a different number of vectors? Importantly, the same definition can be made for any number of vectors. The Gramian of vectors x1 to xp, where p is not necessarily the dimension of the ambient space, is just the determinant of their inner products, as seen here. Note in particular that the Gramian of a single vector x is just the inner product of x with itself. Geometrically, the Gramian of x1 to xp is the squared p-dimensional volume of the parallelopiped formed by x1 to xp. Indeed, if x1 to xp are linearly dependent, then the Gramian is zero, since its rows and columns are linearly dependent, as you can easily verify. On the other hand, if x1 to xp are linearly independent, then the Gramian of x1 to xp is delta 1 of x1 to xp squared, where delta 1 is a normal determinant function on the p-dimensional span of x1 to xp. Using this geometrical interpretation, we can immediately establish basic properties of the Gramian. For example, g of x sigma 1 to x sigma p equals g of x1 to xp for any permutation sigma of the numbers 1 to p. That is, g is unchanged under any rearrangement of its inputs. g of x1 to xp is greater than or equal to 0, and g of x1 to xp is equal to 0 if and only if x1 to xp are linearly dependent. In the plane R2, we already saw that the height h of a vector y over a vector x satisfies h squared equals g of x y over g of x. That is, height squared equals area squared over base squared. More generally, if x1 to xp are linearly independent in E, then the height h of y over the span of x1 to xp satisfies h squared equals g of x1 to xp y over g of x1 to xp. Here g of x1 to xp y is the squared p plus 1 dimensional volume of the parallelopiped formed by x1 to xp and y, while g of x1 to xp is the squared p dimensional volume of the base formed by x1 to xp. Geometrically, this provides a simpler, more direct relationship between p dimensional volume and p plus 1 dimensional volume than determinants alone can, thanks to the inner product. Practically, this tells us how well y can be approximated by a vector in the subspace generated by x1 to xp, which is important in many applications. 
Another striking geometrical result is that g of x1 to xp equals the sum over pi of g of pi x1 to pi xp, where pi ranges over all the projections onto the p-dimensional coordinate subspaces of an orthonormal basis. This says that the square of the p-dimensional volume of a parallelopiped is the sum of the squares of the volumes of its projections onto the p-dimensional coordinate subspaces. Taking n equal to 2 and p equal to 1 gives the classical Pythagorean theorem in the plane. So this result is just a generalized Pythagorean theorem. As an interesting example, the theorem shows that the square of the area of a parallelogram in three-dimensional space is the sum of the squares of the areas of its projections onto the coordinate planes. We can visualize this. Here we have a blue parallelogram determined by two vectors a and b in three-space. The vectors have been moved away from the origin to make things easier to see. The gray parallelogram is the projection of the blue parallelogram onto the E1, E2 coordinate plane, which is highlighted in green. It's just the parallelogram formed by the projections of the vectors A and B, denoted by A12 and B12 respectively, since projection is a linear map. The area of the gray parallelogram is denoted by area 1, 2. Similarly, the blue parallelogram has a projection onto the E2, E3 coordinate plane, with area denoted by area 2, 3. Finally, it has a projection onto the E3, E1 coordinate plane, with area denoted by area 3, 1. Pulling all this together, the theorem says that the square of the area of the single blue parallelogram is equal to the sum of the squares of the areas of the three gray parallelograms. Isn't that cool? By the way, I borrowed these figures from John Vince's excellent book on geometric algebra, which is listed at the end of this video. Be sure to check it out if you want to learn more about this material using the machinery of geometric algebra. While the Pythagorean theorem states an equality, sometimes we don't need equality. A useful inequality states that g of x1 to xp is at most g of x1 to xq times g of xq plus 1 to xp for any q between 1 and p. Geometrically, this says that the volume of a parallelopiped is at most the product of the volumes of any two complementary faces. Repeatedly applying the theorem, we obtain that g of x1 to xp is at most the product of g of x1 through g of xp. In other words, the volume of a parallelopiped is at most the product of the lengths of its edges. Taking p equal to n and expressing the x's in terms of coordinates relative to an orthonormal basis gives Adamar's classic inequality for the determinant, seen here. That last one is due to the prolific French mathematician Jacques Adamar, who as far as I know didn't have any unfortunate encounters with bicycles. Finally, we close this video by observing how the Gramian provides a generalization of the determinant of a linear map, or more precisely, the absolute value of the determinant. As before, let E be an n-dimensional inner product space over R with orthonormal basis E1 to En. Let F be an m-dimensional inner product space over R. Let phi from E to F be a linear map. And let phi tilde to E from F denote the adjoint map with respect to the inner products, called phi adjoint. If you aren't familiar with the adjoint, be sure to check out my video on duality and linear algebra. Note this adjoint is different from the so-called classical adjoint, which is also known as the adjugate or adjunct, covered in my last few videos on determinants. We can define d of phi to be the square root of the determinant of phi adjoint after phi. This definition makes sense since phi adjoint after phi is a linear transformation on E, and the value of its determinant is non-negative. In fact, this is just the square root of the Gramian of phi E1 to phi En, as you can verify. And this holds for any orthonormal basis E1 to En. If E is equal to F, so that phi and phi adjoint are both linear transformations on E, then d of phi squared equals the determinant of phi squared, as seen here. So d of phi, which is the absolute value of the determinant of phi, is just the factor by which phi scales volume. Notice d doesn't capture the sign of the determinant, so it doesn't tell us whether phi preserves or reverses orientation. That's the price we pay for greater generality. In general, when E is not necessarily equal to F, or even of the same dimension as F, D of phi is the n-dimensional volume of the image of a unit n-cube under phi. It follows that D of phi is non-zero if and only if phi is injective, which is nice. 
In particular, d of phi is zero if m is less than n, which makes sense, since it's impossible to fit a volume of a given dimension into a space of lower dimension. So we see how d behaves in some important ways, like a determinant. In the language of matrices, this provides a definition of something like a determinant for rectangular matrices. It turns out that all of this is closely related to the singular value decomposition, which is an extremely important topic in its own right. Unfortunately, we're out of time, so I'll have to save that for another video. Here are the references I used while making this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like and subscribe, and let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thanks for watching.